NPCs, or non-player characters, serve a vital purpose in video games. They're there to give us quests, to sell us potions, and of course, to let us test our weapons on them for a laugh. Ow! Were you trying to hit something behind me? Then maybe think twice next time you're planning on smashing some friendly NPC over the head with a broad axe, brave adventurer, because it turns out that there are plenty of NPCs who, if killed, can really screw you over, both short and long term. See for yourself with these seven NPCs you absolutely should never kill, and beware spoilers ahead for the following games. This will be your final opportunity. Surrender, Sire. I leave you no other choice. The keep shall be ours! In Dungeons & Dragons, the only thing that keeps you from murdering innocent townsfolk for no reason is your moral alignment, or, failing that, your Dungeon Master's patience. Thanks, Johnny. But things are somewhat different in the D&D-based Neverwinter Nights in the Kingmaker expansion, wherein the first thing you do is die taking a face full of orbital laser magic. Stand back. I'll shield who I can. Now, Yana, now! Can I not roll a saving throw or something? No? Okay. Lucky for you, you wake up on the magically blasted battlefield when your dead ass is resurrected by a mysterious shaft of light. So, you do live. Good. I was starting to worry there. Even luckier for you, this mysterious shaft of light transforms itself into a magical weapon of your choosing, so you can get started wandering around in your tattered underwear, stabbing rats. <laughs> Feel the energy that comes with the kill. You are an expert at this, remember? This magic talking sword becomes your constant companion on your main story quest to get yourself elected Lord of the Keep of Cyan, along with your other actual companions. In our case, a tiger lady and a dwarf with his head on fire. Love those guys. And how can Calabast be of assistance now? And things are fine and good as you explore the keep, slaughter goblins to earn votes, and power up your magic talking sword. Already you have started back up the road to success. As you grow in power, so too do I. That is unless, or until, your campaign trail strays from the path of heroism and you decide to murder one of the innocent commoners hanging around the keep. Hello. Minding their own business, thinking, is that a magic missile coming at me right now? I'll not... What are you doing, you fool? I brought you back for the one and only purpose of becoming lord of this keep. At this point, it turns out your magic weapon has strong opinions about you murdering innocent commoners, and it is very disappointed in you for doing such a thing. Also, then it kills you. Permanently. Which is what you get for outsourcing your conscience to a talking sword. I sure hope you have a recent save game. Let's just hope no one's dungeon master is taking notes about a magical sword that kills you for being a jerk. Hi, Johnny. Attacking any NPC in Dark Souls is typically a pretty bad idea. Take Andre the Blacksmith, for example. He didn't even pick up a weapon, and as a blacksmith, he has access to loads of them. That's how much of a scrub you are. There is one NPC in particular, though, that it's especially unwise to murder, and that's Oswald of Karim, who hangs out in the bell tower near the gargoyle bosses in a bizarre arms-wide pose and wearing some extremely shiny-looking fetish wear. Greetings, and welcome back. I am pleased to see the preserving my humanity. A bit of behind the scenes, I was about to make a joke about how he's bought a Halloween costume called Sexy Executioner, but it turns out that's a thing that actually exists. Well, that's this year sorted. Anyway, Oswald of Karim is the only character in Dark Souls who can absolve you of sins, being as he is a servant of Velka, the goddess of sin, which explains the uniform. It is only human to commit a sin. Hey, it sounds weird when you say it like that. 
There are a variety of sins in Dark Souls, but they mainly involve pissing off non-player characters, either by attacking them or breaking the terms of a covenant you've joined. Hellish villain, thou hast used us most foully, thine own family. For thee, no mercy shall be shown. The problem is, unlike the respawning enemies, those sins aren't reset if you die or rest at a bonfire. If you foolishly attacked Andre, he'll be hostile no matter how many times he punches you to death, and the only way to get him back on side and dishing out those sweet weapon upgrades is to have your sins absolved by Ozzy here. My conscience is wiped clean. A bit like his outfit. The problem with Oswald of Karim is twofold. One, that he's hanging out in a corner where his spooky self is guaranteed to give you a jump scare such that you'll reflexively attack him. Oh, that's made that so and two, that if you attack him, reflexively or otherwise, you are now locked in a battle to the death with Oswald and he is understandably, irretrievably, very cross at you. Thou shalt regret this. Fear thine in even he knows you f***ed up, and he's dead. If you then go on to make another NPC hostile, like Andre for instance, there's no longer a friendly Oswald to absolve you and thereby patch up your relationship with Andre, meaning Andre, or whoever, is your enemy for all time. Therefore your already plenty hard Dark Souls playthrough could well turn nigh on impossible. I never noticed before, but with that whole shirtless look, he's really giving sexy blacksmith. I've just had a great idea for a couple's costume. And now a super important. <laughs> we all know the dangers of radiation, but with the right precautions, you can prevent accidental death or even ghoulification. The capital wasteland of Fallout 3 can be a lonely place. Unless you're friendly with giant rad scorpions, then it's not a problem. But for those looking to hear a friendly voice while wandering the wastes, there's no better substitute for real companionship than Galaxy News Radio, home to 1950s swing classics and charming irreverent radio host 3Dog. If you do need to head into the heat, be smart. Give yourself a nice boost of rad eggs first. Remember, only you can prevent human flesh fires. Now, some music. Not only does Three Dogs spin the sickest tunes of 1958, he also provides news updates about what's going on in the wasteland, most of which is due to you, as well as providing encouragement to those seeking to undermine their oppressors. God, ain't that beautiful. But even better, it's finally happened. The water is clean and hell yeah, it's free. Ow! He's great, basically, and being a disembodied voice on the radio, you might imagine that you're never actually going to get to meet 3Dog in person during the game. But that's where you're wrong. Later on in the game, you get the chance to head to the Galaxy News Radio headquarters, where you can find 3Dog in person and chat to him, and he turns out to be just as cool as you imagined. You've got to understand, if I die, so does the voice of the people. I can't take that risk. Your idea of saving the world means combing through the rubble and using a gun. I use my voice. We're two sides of the same coin. Of course, being in the same room as Three Dog also means you're in a position to kill Three Dog, if you so wish. But believe us, you don't want to do that. Oh, you did. OK, well, enjoy Galaxy News Radio now, because it's hosted by a woman named Margaret, who is bad at the job. This is Margaret, and you're listening to, um, how the hell was it? Listen to some music and pray we find someone to replace Three Dog. And she doesn't refer to any of your specific actions. It's me again, Margaret the Technician, talking into the microphone and hoping somebody gives a sh Oh, apart from the one where you killed Three Dog. Uh, Margaret here bringing you a, a music. Why just music? Because I'm just a technician and some asshole murdered our DJ. Thus ruining one of the most enjoyable aspects of wandering the wastes in Fallout 3. If Three Dog were here, he'd say something witty. But he's not, because somebody killed him. So you get me playing music. Yay! Maybe there's something else I can listen to. Hey, I wonder if this Chinese radio beacon has any good tunes. Bison! Bison! <laughs> It'll have to do. So, where do we stand? Our fighters are mopping up the last of their recon picket now. Nothing serious. 
but I've isolated approach signatures for multiple CCS class battle groups. Make it three capital ships per group. And in about 90 seconds, they'll be all over us. Quick, what do you think of when I say Master Chief? Big, heroic, green, possibly a cooking show because you weren't listening properly? Yeah. There's always one. One thing you won't think of when you think of Master Chief is the random slaughter of NPCs, because good guy John117 would never dream of such a thing. Which is why early in the very first Halo game, it lets you know what it thinks of such non-canon nonsense. Well, that's it then. Bring the ship back up to Combat Alert Alpha. I want everyone at their station. Everyone, sir? Everyone. And Cortana. Hmm? Let's give our old friends a warm welcome. The Pillar of Autumn is the first level of Halo Combat Evolved, introducing us to everyone's favorite power-armored paragon as he is thawed out for action. Chief, please look around the room. I need to get a calibration reading for your battlesuit's diagnostics. Being a Spartan and a bona fide UNSC hero, Master Chief is unlikely to wait until the game gives him his first gun, then run back onto the bridge of the ship and shoot Commanding Officer Captain Keys in the face. Which is why it's a terrible idea for you to go and do that. I get what the hell are you doing? Get off Security to the bridge. The Master Chief has gone rampant. Take him down, boys. Halo is not about to stand for this, which is why the second you dome keys, or another friendly NPC for that matter, a squad of invincible marines spawns in to murder you. No matter how hard you try to survive, or pretend that your gun went off accidentally in Keyes' face, these invincible marines will destroy you, Master Chief, the strongest and best Spartan there is. Hey, take that, traitor. Why didn't they let these guys fight in the actual war? I should suggest it to Captain Keyes. All oh, right. For your safety, follow all instructions issued by Alex Mason. Mining engineer. Demolitions Class C. Report to Parker Sector. In Red Faction Guerrilla, you play as a hammer whose goal is to destroy all of Mars. Or at least you may as well do, because while the ostensible star of the game is this guy, Alec Mason, the actual star is his hammer, which is used to hit bad people, knock down bad buildings, and eventually, after doing enough of both those first two things, free Mars from the cruel oppression of the Earth Defense Force. <laughs> Hooray for Hammer! This is going to sound wild, but there is one occasion where you might want to keep your hammer to yourself. It's right at the start of the game when Alec turns up on Mars to begin his new life in the off-world colonies. He's not alone though, he's met by his brother Dan, a Mars veteran who's been here long enough to join the resistance against the evil Earth Defense Force. What the hell was that? The EDF. They own the road and everything else. Forget the propaganda. Free Mars is over. He's also been marked for death by the evil Earth Defense Force. You are under arrest. Surrender or we will open fire. Alex, run! Run! <laughs> That's how it usually goes, if you're playing the game properly. If you're just too dang excited to be given control of the world's best hammer, you might find yourself deciding to test it out on the first thing available, which happens to be sweet brother Dan, with whom you share so many childhood memories and genetic code. As you can imagine, Dan is less structurally sound than, say, a building, and so goes spiralling off into the distance like Team Rocket, at which point the game ends and you get treated to this game over screen, which is so pissed off at you that it uses three exclamation points. That or someone hit the exclamation point key with a big hammer. There's a lot of that going around these days. Mission Impossible is a 1990 NES adaptation of neither the classic original series nor the Tom Cruise movie, but rather the late 80s revival series that nobody liked, so already we're off to a good start. In the game you play as three characters with varied skills such as shooting, punching and boomerang. Like in the TV series I imagine, there's literally no way of knowing. Anyway, being the good guys of the Impossible Mission Force, you are forbidden from killing the NPC civilians that roam the streets of whatever city we're in here. Which is fine, except for the fact that the game never tells you this, and so the second you step out onto the streets of the first level and see someone up ahead of you, you're going to shoot at them, at which point your character sinks to their knees in grief and the IMF helicopter swoops in and spirits them away, presumably to jail. 
OK, you think to yourself, playing as your second character, I won't shoot that civilian sprite. But look up there, that guy's in a trench coat, he must be a spy or something. Wrong again, jail for you. OK, final life, I won't shoot anything that looks like either of these NPCs. Except twist, some of them are evil and trying to kill you. And then you run into traffic trying to avoid them. And that's game over. No wonder they called it Mission Impossible. I have to go. The enemy is closing in. I will be back. You'll feel better. I promise. As you begin Baldur's Gate 3, you are presented with an elaborate character creator, wherein you spend a casual three or four hours deciding on your hero's haircut. Just me? Okay, fine. Then, when you're done selecting your genitals and fiddling with your ability scores, and at last you're finally ready to step out into the world to have an adventure, suddenly you get... You need a guardian. Shoot him. I need a what now? The Guardian is a mysterious NPC that, for reasons unknown to you at this point, is yours to customise. It's not at all clear why you need a Guardian or who they are, but judging by their ethereal backdrop and fancy armour, they are surely someone as mystical as they are important. So you better get their haircut right. Flash forward several hours and you will have gradually become acquainted with this Guardian as an enigmatic dream visitor who sometimes pops by to advise you in your sleep. I came just in time. You are transforming. And this NPC tells you it is they who are keeping the Mind Flayer parasite in your brain from converting you into a hideous Mind Flayer. You will not become a Mind Flayer. Not while I'm around. I'll protect you. Which, cheers for that, but then at the end of the second act of the game there comes a pivotal moment when, for complicated but extremely important reasons, you find yourself on the astral plane, doing battle with a squad of Githyanki, joining forces with your Dream Guardian. Where's our Dream Guardian? I'm here! Help me! I'm under attack! At this point it is revealed that your Dream Guardian has been dream catfishing you and they are in fact themselves a hideous mind flayer and not the dishy dreamboat you whipped up in the character creator. Don't let my form deceive you. Uh, I am the one that's been protecting you. I am the one now, I would like to believe you, friend, but it also turns out that you're a big lying squid face. If you choose not to believe your erstwhile ally and instead opt to attack this Mind Flayer because that's what you do with Mind Flayers, especially ones called the Emperor, then I'm afraid you've started down a path that is as dark as it is short. Fool. Without me, you will perish. Defeat this Mind Flayer in battle, and as the squid faced former dreamboat shuffles off this mortal coil, you will figure out much too late the truth that actually, yeah, they were the only thing keeping you from transforming into a hideous Mind Flayer. You have failed us all. Ah. Now all that remains is to kick back and fail to enjoy the bleakest possible ending of Baldur's Gate 3, wherein you miss out on the entire third act of this enormous game, the fun bit where you actually get to Baldur's Gate, by succumbing to the will of the mega mind flayer known as the Absolute. You are found. Now you hear me. Now you yield! In this way, you are helplessly recruited into her grand design to conquer the world, by which I mean squelchily transformed into a Mind Flayer thrall. <laughs> no, my haircut! That took me hours. Join me. Thrall! Thank you so much for watching this video about NPCs that you should never kill unless you want to ruin your game. Um, please don't kill me, Andy. Uh, I will give you some vital information to carry on with your quest. That's right, you should watch either of these two videos. They contain the clues you need to solve Andy's murder. 
Uh, so just watch either of those and uh, the killer will be revealed to you. Please, this is from beyond the grave. I don't know where I'm going with this. Anyway, please <laughs> click on one of these. Uh, avenge my death. Thank you so much.